All right. Uh, good evening, Bethel Island, and uh, everyone from East Contra Costa that has joined us this evening. It's August 13th, and we are doing our East Contra Costa Fire Protection District Town Hall that is dedicated to Bethel Island and is going to have some specific answers to questions that are for residents of Bethel Island. I really appreciate everyone joining us here this evening. I wanted to do a quick introduction of myself. My name is Brian Oftedal. I'm the president of East Contra Costa Fire. I've been a director for roughly four years or so. I started out as an appointed director and a couple of years ago we went to an elected board and I've been with them since. And I did want to give a little bit of a, a background since we are specific to Bethel Island. I haven't done with this with the other communities, but quickly, I kind of wanted to go back a handful of years, actually a little over 20 years. Uh, I, I work, for those of you that don't know me, I work as a firefighter full time. I'm actually a captain and a paramedic uh, in, in the East Bay. And I started my firefighting career in Bethel Island as a firefighter paramedic when we had that program. And I asked uh, for Susanna if she'd share a couple of pictures and we're gonna see if we can do a screen share and share a couple of those pictures. I just sent them over to her a couple of minutes ago. I thought it'd be fun, but for those of you that see, I'm uh, probably 36 to 40 pounds lighter, uh, maybe about, oh uh, well, yeah, definitely 20 something years younger. But uh, I thought it'd be fun to put this on here with uh, old station 95, old engine 95. And uh, this is really, truly where I got my start in the fire service, working for Chief David Wall um, back in the day and uh, getting an opportunity to go to a, to a big city. And uh, this is really why I'm here as a director right now, because I believe that Bethel Island gave me so much uh, and I have a debt to repay. And that's uh, basically what I'm doing now as a director. I'm uh, volunteering at least 40 hours a week. And uh, I'm gonna just keep going hard 40 hours a week until I can, I uh, think, at least the agreement, and I don't know if I can call it a true agreement with my wife, if she'd buy into that, but at least my agreement with her is that uh, if she'd allow me to get a couple more fire stations open, then uh, I'd kick it down a notch. So it's a little picture of my mother and I uh, when I was working out in Bethel Island 20 plus years ago in the late 90s. So. Uh, that being said, I'm gonna, uh, I do, I am very passionate about uh, the work that I'm doing as an elected director as well as being in public safety. I truly believe in uh, being a good Samaritan and giving back to the community and giving back to Bethel Island. Um, with a couple of special guests tonight, I uh, actually pre-COVID, I guess I'll speak in that tense that, um, you know, I still spend some time out on Bethel Island when I can. And uh, both of these special guests that we have talking for a couple of minutes this evening and I'll, I'll share a little bit of that, but I do enjoy going back and utilizing the, the restaurants, going to La Villa, going to the fifties bash, the, uh, you know, watching the fish race and doing all that kind of stuff. I do enjoy going out there. I feel like uh, Bethel Island, there's a little bit of uh, Bethel Island in me. That being said, I'm going to get through a couple of uh, housekeeping items real quick. Uh, I think everybody will be muted. Uh, from the back end and uh, the presenters this evening will have the opportunity to easily unmute, but I'd ask for you to keep it muted just so we can prevent any background noise. Uh, for those of you that would like to speak, once we start the question and answer period, you can either physically raise your hand. I know that we've got some folks that are watching the screens and will uh, do their best to call on you. There is also a raise hand feature um, I start out talking about uh, on my iPad that I'm using right now in the upper right hand corner, there's three dots. And if I click on those, there's a feature that says raise hand. There's also a chat feature. So you could either raise your hand if you'd like to speak or you could hit the chat and uh, type in what your question is and we'll do our very best to get to it. On other systems, uh, other desktops, lower part of the screen, uh, under names, you'll see a raised hand feature. If you're on your telephone, you can press star nine and that should unmute yourself. Uh, otherwise, just uh, like I said, physically raising your hand, but uh, just if you can uh, populate some of that stuff in chat, we can uh, get, get work in getting you in line. That being said, I'm gonna do, uh, I think that's all I'm gonna say for uh, housekeeping items because we did have some technical difficulties. I do wanna get moving on as quick because I know there are a lot of questions out there and 
preemptively, we've actually were able to get some of those questions and um, Chief Helmick will get working on those uh, pretty quick. Without further ado, I think uh, probably a number of people on this call this evening know Mark Whitlock. Mark Whitlock has been a advocate of the fire district for quite some time. I run into him uh, quite frequently at meetings, whether they're finance meetings, board meetings. Uh, he's big with OES and other uh, townships and communities within our district and uh, the safety fair that uh, he historically helps facilitate annually. Uh, when I have the opportunity, I know I've had the opportunity to have breakfast and lunch with him out in Bethel Island at a couple of different restaurants and that's been nice to do. Mark and I have also spent some time out in Bethel Island working on the AED program, the Automated External Defibrillator Program, that uh, where there are AEDs that are strategically placed around the island. I know that's something that uh, I'm very passionate in is uh, CPR education, uh, AED availability, community response, and uh, maybe Mark can talk about that a little bit. But without further ado, Mark, if you wouldn't mind just spending a couple of minutes talking about why you're here and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the AED program has been uh, really good out here. We've had a lot of real positive response. We have a total of five units out here right now. Um, about four, one of them unfortunately got stolen. Uh, I'm getting that replaced here very shortly. Uh, so uh, that aspect. Yeah, my my history with, uh, with the district started on September 8th of 08. Uh, we had a fire a few doors down from my fiance and I live, and uh, uh, it was a very big awakening uh, to us of what was going on with the district and uh, all of the issues that were um, plaguing the district uh, from, from the outside, if you will. Uh, and so we started trying to help with some of those, and the dry hydrant program was uh, one of those. One of the things that became very obvious with the uh, ultimate closures of stations with the uh, post-08 uh, uh, financial effect of the district, uh, it started creating major issues with the insurance company. And uh, we worked very hard trying to get uh, the one assessment passed in uh, 15 and uh, I shared with people numerous times the insurance uh, pitfalls of uh, having stations go away. Um, and, you know, you, you look at a five year span of one uh, customer of mine and, you know, 198.2% increase uh, is very scary. Well, wow, we're talking about some very, very serious money. And, Ironically, that particular person that had those rates, uh, their house was one of the ones that burned down on Taylor Road. Uh, and uh, I believe she's in the process of getting that rebuilt now. Um, the, uh, the meetings that I have attended over the years um, are uh, a lot. The, uh, the information uh, I was on information overload pretty much after every meeting, but uh, with the help of uh, Chief Henderson and now uh, with Chief Helmut uh, answering questions and providing me with information to share with other people in the community uh, has worked out extremely well. Um, we have had a just a run of, you know, uh, exaggerated uh, response times and uh, the the chief and staff have been uh, very good about getting actual copies of uh, reports to me so that I can share them with the community, showing them that, uh, you know, the Franks Co fire, for one, everyone was insisting it was 45 minutes to an hour, and it was 11 minutes and 17 seconds. Uh, these guys have been busting their butt to get out here and take care of us the very best they can. Uh, when the nearest station's in Oakley, uh, that is what it is. Uh, but I'm always available to anybody in the community. Uh, my phone number is 925-351-3759. And uh, willing to talk to anybody about any 
particular issues that they have today, tomorrow, next week, next year. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate uh, you sharing that and uh, your continuous advocacy over the years. Appreciate having you on our team. And uh, I'd like to also uh, bring on our next uh, guest this evening. I've got Linda Nash. And Linda, I had an opportunity to, uh, while I was sitting down and uh, having a meeting in Bethel Island, I happened to meet her at the Rusty Porthole. And uh, we were able to chat it up quite a bit there. And uh, our next board meeting, she came out to Brentwood and actually spoke at our meeting. Uh, so I'd ask this evening whether she'd be willing to say a couple of words also. And uh, Linda, I know that you're having some trouble getting on Zoom, but I believe that you're on uh, phone. And if you wouldn't mind just saying a couple of words, please. Well, thank you. Um, I really love the idea that I can be able to thank all of you firefighters and let our community know just how important this fire department is. And I did want to tell you that I have two little quick stories. Um, one's kind of funny, but I guess oh, about 10 years ago, I had a seizure in bed and my husband called 911. We had three Pomeranians and he told me that he could barely get the dogs in the other room for the paramedics to be here, um, which was amazing. That was when we had a fire department here. Um, I have to tell you, the funny part is you go to bed at night and you're, you fall asleep and the next thing you know, you've got four firemen standing in your bedroom. It's kind of scary. <laughs> Maybe if I was younger, it would have been great. But that just goes to show the response time that was there when I needed them. Uh, we had a bad fire behind our mobile home park. Again, the fire department was amazing. And uh, I am wanting to speak to let people understand that how important it is that we get our fire department when the fire department was standing on the corner saying, hey, support us, support us, people didn't understand that, yes, uh, your taxes would go up a little bit, but your insurance went way more. And frankly, I'd rather have the tax in the fire department here than no fire department at all. Um, and I have to agree with Mark with how people exaggerate the time that gets here. It does take longer. That's why we're all so excited to get this fire department that's on Cyprus and Bethel Island Road going because I'm understanding that that could cut the time in half at 14 minutes, which means it would only take seven minutes. So... I want to try to get people to really understand how important. I did have one gentleman say, well, damn, if my house catches on fire, it'll be burned down before they even get here. And I said, well, what about the, a heart attack or, you know, the choking, whatever the case may be, they're there. And he said, oh, well, I didn't think of that. We need to get the community to understand how important this fire department is. And if I sound enthusiastic, I am because I know how important it is to have these people taking care of us and money well spent. And that's really all I have to say, um, except for I'm so grateful to each and every one of you. I, I just don't know my heart goes out to it and if there's anything I can do <laughs> to help out I'd be more than happy I'll stand on the corner and and root for you guys thank you Linda yeah I can definitely hear the the passion in your voice um, almost wonder whether uh, whether I was in your house with those Pomeranians 
20 plus years ago. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, it was about, well, that was when I first, it was probably in 98, 99. <laughs> but it was a strange feeling to go to sleep and then wake up with firemen at your bed. But how grateful my husband was, how grateful I was. And that's what people really need to think about. Thank, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, appreciate your words. Um, yeah, and just, just speaking to the response times and opening up that station, uh, I know we're, we're very passionate on finding a funding source to get that station open. I think you could easily suggest right off the bat that I think you could easily say that our response times would be in cut in half opening that station, especially if right. you break, uh, break the, uh, the island up into north and south. Uh, obviously, the island is big. It's stretched. Uh, but I think we could easily respond to the south end of the island and hit those times in a four to five minute time frame pretty easy. Obviously, you're going to be getting over into the uh, some of the other ends, the sugar barge and that that side of the island is probably closer to the eight, nine minute range, but still a heck of a lot better than where we're at today. And I know that right. you have talking points, but I will... Uh, I'll leave those to him, but thank you for being here. And I also, uh, I failed to do so, but one of my counterparts, uh, Adam Langro, who is uh, elected director, is on the call with us. He's uh, gonna be here, he's gonna be uh, available, but he's more so in a listening mode this evening, just so we don't uh, violate any any rules, any, any uh, laws that are out there tonight. He's gonna be more in a listening mode, but that being said, uh, Adam, thank you for being here this evening. And uh, thank you to everyone else. And without further ado, Chief, Chief uh, Brian Helmick is going to be jumping on and uh, sharing a presentation. Thank you, Chief. All right. Good evening. And thank you, President Alton. I just want to confirm you can hear me. Yes. I got, I got the thumbs up. Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to be doing some screen sharing. So bear with me through this technical step here. All right. So a couple things I just want to highlight on is, um, again, I'm very thankful for everyone that is here. I've actually been looking forward uh, for a long time for an opportunity to come back uh, to provide not only an update, but provide answers and questions uh, to the residents of Bethel Island. Uh, to be clear, there are many other people um, attending this meeting, there will be many other people who will watch this meeting that are not Bethel Island residents. Um, this is gonna be recorded and this is being recorded. I really wish there was hundreds of people here tonight. Uh, you know, we don't have hundreds of people here, but I anticipate hundreds will reflect back on this and watch this as I hope that all of you will share uh, with those throughout the community that we're not able to attend. Uh, we, on the housekeeping end, we will tell you that we have a splash page on our website where all the town hall meetings are being archived. And all the FaceTime live videos that we're doing on specific topics are archived. And this, presentation uh, is the same presentation we're doing throughout all of the communities. However, there are some very specific challenges that we have and some hot topics per se in Bethel Island. And I wanna let you know as your fire chief, it's important to me to be as timely, as transparent, as authentic as I can and bring you the information. And that's the objective here tonight. So we do have very specific Bethel Island topics. I think it's important that we address those and I'm hoping it addresses a lot of questions that may be asked, but we also have the question and answer session that will occur um, at the end of this session. Uh, so the presentation here tonight may run a little bit longer uh, because we do have more topics that I'm gonna be going over, but um, I wanna make sure that you all know that this information I feel to be very important. Tonight, what I'm gonna be working to go through, uh, because again, I don't know our complete target audience and I don't know if we're gonna be starting the conversation with you or if you're well-versed on this topic and you wanna get further into the weeds on specific topics. So for those individuals that feel this is either too elementary or way too advanced to understand that I'm available to you outside of these conversations. Uh, my Fire Marshal Steve Albert, which we'll be presenting a portion of this tonight, is available to you um, to continue these conversations because it, it needs to take a continuation of a conversation, you being actively involved in understanding what's going on in our district. I've been the privilege to be the fire chief since 2017, and I'm still learning. And I'm still working every day to be able to address our issues. But tonight I'm gonna to be focusing on, again, who we are, 
our current challenges, the paths we're taking to correct our challenges, some recent service level reductions you may have seen that came out through a press release as July 1, Bethel Island specific topics. We're gonna to talk about your tax rate areas. Your tax rate areas are higher than throughout the rest of the jurisdiction. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how they originated, how they occurred, how they impact the district. And I'm hoping to give you clarity on the whole story behind them. Uh, again, to be accurate, um, I'm gonna discuss response times. I'll also discuss the old station 95, which is currently being uh, surplused or sold and the newly constructed station, that's its, re its replacement station right down the road, station 55. I'll provide you an update on the fireboat. And then Chief Albert is going to provide you an update on hazard abatement. And we're going to talk about the dry hydrants in Bethel Island. Again, if we do not uh, satisfy all these conversations, we'll continue them with you. But I believe that'll be a very good start to be able to bring you the information um, to move forward the conversations. We'll also provide you additional locations for additional information on the district or point you to them provide you updates on um, upcoming events, and, and then obviously get into a question and answer session. Uh, so what I wanna do is jump into this because, and I'll hit things along the way, uh, but I also wanna kind of put a disclaimer on this. Uh, and I'm gonna say this at the beginning, is one of the biggest challenges I have as East Contra Costa Fire Chief is that I have to serve many different communities, Brentwood, Oakley, Knights in Bethel Island, Discovery Bay, Byron, Marsh Creek and Morgan Territory, and every individual community, I'm challenged with the complexity of them looking at their challenges only from their community's perspectives, and I don't have that privilege. I have to look at it from the entirety, the global perspective. And so as we get into this tonight, I'm asking if you may share those, that perspective and look through our lenses of the gravity of the problem that we have addressing a jurisdictional issue. And I'm hoping as we go through this, you're gonna realize, although you, your service levels are not adequate, your service levels are not appropriate, your service levels need to be increased, but the impacts and the challenges you have are not unique to Bethel Island. They're fi East Contra Costa fire service issues across the board. And so I really wanna fix the problems that we have in this district. We have not created them. Those that are here leading the district, working through the district, from the fire board to my staff, we take full responsibility, however, of where we are, but we're trying to correct things that we did not create, and we're fully invested in correcting. So tonight will be a, a conversation starter, or maybe expanding upon where you're at, uh, but we are doing everything within our power to fix where we are. So let me teach you a little bit about and educate and update you on who we are. Again, as I stated, we serve two cities in the unincorporated areas of East Contra Costa County, Brentwood, Oakley, Knights and Bethel Island, Discovery Bay, Marsh Creek, Morgan Territory, and Byron. 250 square mile footprint. So that goes from Antioch to Old River Bridge, uh, all the waterways from the uh, Antioch Bridge to the Old River Bridge, all the waterways that go in between. We go to Mountain House towards Tracy, Vasco Road to Livermore, Mar Marsh Creek Road to Clayton, Morgan Territory up into Livermore. It's a large footprint, 250 square miles, 128,000 residents, that goes to 155,000 when you increase it in the workers and business people that come into our communities. Currently, we have nine firefighters on duty every day out of three stations. We should have no less than six stations and 18 firefighters every single day. The reason we need those resources and those assets is because we answer or we get called to 7,700 calls a year and it takes 9,500 pieces of equipment to mitigate those 7,700 calls. So just because we have 7,700 emergencies, it takes 9,500, almost 9,600 fire engines to mitigate them. Because sometimes we send one engine, two engine, three engines, and if things get spare and we have to go to county mutual aid, we'll go up to 30 engines. So we have a very large area. Our governance and our history is a large part of our problem that we have begun to correct in 2019. We historically, when you look, we see there's been services provided out here since the 20s. There's been multiple small organizations that have consolidated through many years. Bethel Island Fire was Bethel Island Fire from 1947 until 2002. The Oakley Fire District was the Oakley Fire Department and became Oakley Knightson, 
It was a small period of time. They actually were absorbed by Con Fire, and then they came back to Oakley Knightson back in 98, and they were consolidated with Bethel Island, Oakley Knightson Fire Protection District with East Diablo. And so in 2002, we became one. All the volunteer combination agencies became one organization to who we are today, and I actually came in through that process. Like President Oftedal, I was a volunteer firefighter with Oakley Knights and Fire Protection District. They came out here in the late 90s solely to gain experience. I was from the Moraga area and I was coming out here to get experience to go back home. I said, give me three years and I'll be right back. 20 some odd years, 25 years, I'm still here. I, I fell in love with our communities. I'm invested to who we are. I understand our problems and, I, and I'm invested to help correct them. Our governance in 2002 to 2010, we were actually governed by the Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors as a dependent organization. Then we became an appointed board and we always intended to be independent, which means governed by ourselves, independent of the county. And in 2009, we had nine board members that were appointed, four from Brentwood, three from Oakley, um, uh, three from Oakley and two from the county. And that appointed board was in place from 2010 till 2019 to the elected board of five that we have here today for the last two years. I, I wanna be clear that again, I take full responsibility, the fire board takes full responsibility of where we are today and we are invested into correcting the issues. But I will tell you that there's decades worth of decisions not being made, decades worth of not addressing growth effectively and putting the appropriate mitigation measures on growth. And if we had done the things we're doing today to address growth, we would not be talking about service level challenges in East Contra Costa Fire and we're working to correct those. So the reason I show this slide is that our governance and or lack thereof and our history is a true indicating and enforcing factor to where we are today. Today we have a current three stations. We have one in Oakley at Cyprus and O'Hara, one in Brentwood at John Muir Parkway and Balfour, and then one in Discovery Bay at Point of Timber, uh, Point of Timber and um, Bixler Road. That's where we are today. On the right-hand side, those stations are there. You can see the, the hats that are there, but you'll also see that we have existing deficits and growth deficits. We know today we are, we are short three stations and these three stations and where to decide it is done by population, it's done by call volume and also by time and distance. And right now we have an existing deficit of three stations and one of those is station 55 at Bethel Island in Cyprus. One is in uh, Brentwood at the intersection of Grant and Empire. And one is downtown Brentwood, which is the um, shutter station across from Bank of America. We also know over the next 20 years with the additional growth that comes in, we're gonna need an additional three stations to bring us to a total of nine. And that's identified by the blue circles. Another one in Oakley, uh, which is, uh, down by uh, Neroli and um, uh, Neroli and the overpass by the church, by the little church. And then 57 is at Brentwood Boulevard in the Lone Tree area. And then station uh, 58 in Discovery Bay is gonna be near the shuttered station that we have in Discovery Bay, but we're working to move it closer to um, the highway four in Discovery Bay or the new Ford entrance in that area. We're looking for land as we speak. So the thing is today we have three stations, we're short three stations. And we know with growth, we're gonna need an additional three stations. The current challenges we have are very simple. We are not providing adequate fire protection because we are short three stations. And we know that we need six stations, not just nine firefighters on a day, but 18 firefighters a day to strategically place these stations to increase response times, response capabilities. That's the number one problem that we have. And the funding that we have, as I showed you on the previous chart, is our funding was established in the 70s through a Proposition 13. And I'm gonna to talk to you about tax rate areas. I'm gonna to talk to you about specifically how Bethel Island was formed um, in regards to the tax rate areas. But in the 70s, when the tax rate areas were formed, each jurisdiction, if you look back to the previous chart, whoever governed them, and at the time it was Bethel Island Fire, they fought for a certain level of funding to be able to adequately be able to provide the services they had at that time. And throughout, the whole jurisdiction in a, entirely, it was funded as a volunteer fire organization. And collectively when we merged together, all those funds came together. So right now we are providing 
24 7 365 services and operations off of funding that was intended for volunteer type services and over the past 30 40 years as growth has continued we have not added any additional assessments incrementally on each home an assessment on each home that would be given to the fire district annually to increase the revenues into the district to pay for ongoing services so today we are sustainable administratively with the revenues we have at three stations. We are not gonna go down any lower. We are three stations, but to increase stations, we need additional revenue. We cannot place assessments on properties. We cannot get money magically just from elsewhere to address the existing level deficit without getting support from the communities and or another revenue source, which I'll talk about. The second challenge that we have is addressing growth effectively. And that is something this fire board is doing I'm going to classify what I believe to be a wonderful job in regards to addressing our growth challenge. We have been working for the past three years to stop the bleeding. And right now we are in the implementation process of building two mechanisms, which I'll discuss here in a moment, but I want to focus on the challenges is addressing growth. And again, addressing growth, if we don't stop and don't change and don't put the mechanisms in place for the next 20 years, our problem is going to compound because we'll be short in other three stations. So existing service level challenges are our first problem and growth is our second. So the path to increase services, what are we doing? We have underneath our three station model, which administrable or sustainable, but operationally, you know it, you feel it, we're not. And it's not alone and, and, and respectfully to Bethel Island, it's not unique to Bethel Island. We, we, we're doing these meetings everywhere and no one is satisfied. I hear all the time how they're underserved and I understand and I agree. The problem statement's true. The solution statement is the complexity. So one thing I'll say right now is what we're doing is we are living within our means. No more teeter-totters, no more upstaffing, downstaffing, because that insustainability caused retention issues. We were deferring payments on all sorts of capital equipment replacement. Our equipment was becoming a problem. Succession planning was a problem. Holding employees was a problem. We've corrected that. The fire board, staff, working with labor, we have corrected that. Right now we're sustainable, but we can't provide adequate services. We're also preparing for growth. If growth and revenue come into the district, if, if revenue is put into the machine, services will increase. We have a plan, we have a plan in place. We're also building our infrastructure and that's what station 55 down the street is. It's preparation and we are prepared. When revenue comes in, we can sustainably hire firefighters to staff it, it will be staffed. If revenue came in tomorrow, that is the first station that would be staffed. It is, it's equipped, it's there and it's built. We just don't have the revenue. We are also living within our means, increase our infrastructure, reinforcing the plan to understand to manage growth effectively over time. But we're looking at future potential assessments, potential taxes, but we're also exploring every other alternative underneath the moon. We're looking at the federal level, we're looking at the state level, we're looking at the local level, we're exploring consolidation, things we've all done before that didn't prove to, prove to be any results. But we're gonna continue keeping on and we're gonna wait until November and continue to exhaust all options. And then the board is have to entertain the results of those options and that's why it's important for all of you to be engaged. To say, did the district do its due diligence? Did it explore other options? Did it work with the other communities? State, local, federal, everywhere. And is the ask reasonable? That is for the board to say, do they move forward or not? And it is for the community, if, if we get there, to say that we support or not. But until then, it's my job to run the district with its means and share our concerns we have. In regards to growth, I'm very excited to say that we are, like I stated, we are mitigating this issue. There are two mechanisms that were missed for decades. One of them was in place, but the numbers and the rate of which we had on return were and are in some areas inadequate and we're correcting it. It's called impact fees. Impact fees are a fee paid by developers incrementally on every unit that comes in their jurisdiction. It's a one-time fee. And that fee goes into a pot of money, which is restricted. It cannot be used for anything else except for building stations and buying apparatus to address the impacts from growth. The fees that we've been receiving that we are updating and implementing right now in Oakley, those, those, those fees were established in 1984 because they were adopted from the county. And in the county, they were also established in 1984 and they were not updated, they're antiquated. 
And we have a study in place and we're working on implementation phase in the months of August and September uh, with the cities of Oakley and the county. We just got them approved in Brentwood just last week to fix the impact fees again to the rates we need, we know we need to build three stations into the future. The flip side of the coin with development is getting what's called CFDs, community facility districts, placed on all new development as we move into the future. Those CFDs are an assessment that the, that the developer is responsible for until they send the home and then it's transferred to the new homeowner and they pay it on an annual basis. And those CFDs pay for the ongoing operations of the station. We currently have some CFDs in the district. We participate in one in the Delta Coast project. There's one in the Summer Lakes area and in Oakley in the Gilbert properties. And the district is very aware that those CFDs exist. We need those CFDs everywhere. Furthermore, if, it, if the CFDs that we're gonna be establishing, hopefully, hopefully next month, the district will establish a district-wide CFD that all future development will be annexed into to finally stop the bleeding what brought us here. But I want you to be clear about something. If the district, I'm stressing, if the district decides to go out for an assessment, they are very readily aware of the inequities of those with CFDs and those without CFDs. And there will be a mechanism in place to make sure people do not get double taxed if there is another assessment placed to everybody. We are very aware of it. We are sensitive to it. And it is important for us to address. So I just want to make note of that. But we're on the growth challenge. We've been spending three years whittling this. And I'm excited to say that we're finally at a point where I believe in September, um, August and September, that we should be at the implementation phase over the next over 20 years, we'll get three stations, but it does nothing to address our existing service levels. CFDs and impact fees cannot legally, they can only address future growth, not past growth. And so again, look, it's gonna take all of us, we're exploring all options, be engaged, be involved, look and see what we're doing. Um, and hopefully people are motivated by what's been done over the past three years to correct where we are. You may have seen on July 1 that there were service level reductions. Um, these were a long time in the coming and they were by far the hardest decision I had to make as the fire chief. I wanna let you know that these service level reductions are something I have been struggling with and we've been working hand in hand with labor and we held on in a lot of ways. I delayed this decision for over a year. But I realized that we were not in a position uh, to increase service levels anytime soon. The straw that broke the back was the COVID situation. I knew the COVID was gonna add a layer of complexity of educating, communicating, and getting resolution because everyone pockets books were gonna be impacted. And when COVID hit, we also on an annual basis look at our aid agreements that we have with other agencies. And we have aid agreements with agencies that are intended to be balanced at the end of every year so, so different agencies don't subsidize other agencies. And a year ago, we had reduced sending our engines and our personnel and our firefighters to fires with three engines and not five, like everybody else does throughout the county. And I thought, and we thought by making that change, reducing from three to five, or five to three, I'm sorry, that the aid agreements would become more comparable. But even doing so, when we reassessed, and we, we adjusted and we saw, we're still sending, Contra Costa County Fire is still sending two to three units for every one we sent them, even with that change. And so, the aid agreements were being strained and I need to make sure I can hold on to them and live within our means. And I also knew that additional revenue coming into the district would be compounded by COVID. And I have to create the safest environment for our firefighters. And so this is the changes that were made. Two things that we had to do because we're being overrun is number one is our engine companies sometimes are up for 24 to 48 hours, to 36 hours. Sometimes our members don't sleep, and if they do, it's in the middle of the day because they're just trying to get a couple hours of rest. With that being said is we had to cancel all public education events, all station tours, all birthday parties, and it's detrimental to us. I was influenced by that by a kid. There's a lot of things that we do to educate our community, but they have to be ready for mission-critical incidents and being available to answer the call when they come in. They're also falling behind on their training because they're up running calls, and it was just we're at critical mission right now. Secondarily, the reduction of we're only going to a defensive firefighter stance. I want to say on the forefront that I'm responsible for the communications and it's a hard thing to communicate. And in hindsight, there's probably a lot of ways that I could communicate it better. 
but we are very clearly trying to let folks know that we're trying to live within our means. And this is the change that was made. And I wanna be very clear. Our defensive operations are this. When we responded to a fire prior to July 1, if there were smoke and flames showing, we would automatically, just because there were smoke and flames showing, call for additional resources from Contra Costa County Fire. Due to the fact that aid agreements continue to be imbalanced, and due to the fact that we have no, nothing in sight in the near future to be able to get additional revenue to incre increase services on our side, and our members are only responding with three engines at a disadvantage, the change that was made was if the three engines cannot keep the container inside of the box, or if there's not a life safety issue, and we're in rescue mode until proven otherwise, you do not call for additional resources and handle it with three. I also want to make something clear. Our members do not stand idle. We have a can-do attitude and we get criticized all the time. You should have done something differently. You should have done more. And we take that to heart. We don't want any life loss. We don't want any property loss. We do the best we can with what we have. We build the box and keep the fire inside the box. And a lot of people are very critical of our tactics from time to time, but they're not just at our hip. And we do try. We try the best we have with the resources we have. So the change that is made right now is, again, we don't stand idle. We do the best we can with what we have. We cannot overextend ourselves because if our members get compromised, folks need to know we are our own 911 system. And when we call 911, we call upon ourselves. And I'm sending my members the fires with half the resources they have. So we have to take a exterior to interior attack as we, as we move forward. This is where I normally would end our presentation. And this is the thing where I'm hoping I can address some questions and talk about very specific Bethel Island questions. I'm going to get into, and I'm going to give this somewhat quick, and it, it may require additional conversation later on, and I welcome that. Look, I want to be very authentic and transparent here. Look, I didn't create this, but I want to give you guys the truth and the whole story. I understand all the tax rate areas throughout our jurisdiction. I want to educate and inform people so they can get the information and double check my math, and let's have a conversation about it. But it, it, I, want to, I want to make sure the factual information is out there. So when it comes down to tax rate areas, now I also want to be clear is that we're in budget process right now. Our new budget is going to be approved. These meetings, one in the district day to day, it takes a lot of time. This is the same presentation I gave the last Bethel Island town hall meeting. So those that you weren't there, this is relevant, accurate information I gave, but it, I put the, the number up there, uh, late 2018. So the numbers, this slide is, except for the top revenue, our revenue is higher. It's closer to 17 million now, but this is 2018. The bottom line, what I want to show you is we get 96% of our revenue through property taxes. By statute and law, that's how we get revenue. And that's how we increase revenue. Our statute, the law that we're governed under, the 1987 Fire Protection Law and Statute says that we can add assessments to increase revenues. So that's how we're funded and that's where our revenue comes in is through taxes. There are over 200 what we call TRAs. I'm going to reference tax rate areas. I'm going to reference as a TRA as we move forward. But there's between two to 300, probably 240-ish tax rate areas in our jurisdiction. The tax rate areas are, are broken down into what's called the ad valorem. There's an ad valorem, which I'll show you here in a minute. But we get about 8% of the 1% of ad valorem. And this is an important point is other agencies, Confire, San Ramon Valley, Morag, Rinna, they have a higher ad valorem now, but that goes back to the 70s when they were funded. Each one of those agencies I'm showing you are 24-7, 365, and many of them had paramedics on their engines in the 70s. Morag, Rinda started the paramedic program in the county, and so that's why they are one of the highest. But the point being is we were a volunteer organization when this was established and we didn't do anything to address the growth impacts and bring additional revenue beyond Proposition 13. That's why we have a gap. And we need to be able to try to address that gap. What you can do to do your own math to be able to look at this and understand this and double check and I want you guys to have access relevant information is on the bottom of the screen. And this will be again a videotape so you can come back and reference this. But if you go to the Contra Costa County's website where my taxes go, this information is there too. But this is a normal tax bill that everybody gets. The, the circled area is, what is a TRA. You have a TRA and there's a certain number. And your, your certain number is gonna give you what your 
your countywide one percent is and all the other assessments that you pay for and so that information is on your tax bill and you can look and see what you can find on the, the, the previous one that I just showed you on this tax rate area, so that 1% that everyone gets charged, and I think this is a key point. Everyone in the fire district gets charged 1%, but how the pie is cut up is different. Everyone pays the same 1% within the district. It's just how it's allocated is different. So the residents of Brentwood, the residents of, everyone's paying 1%, and they may have specific assessments above that within their communities, but everyone pays the same 1%. In this case right here, the, the 1% is 20, uh, 28, almost $2,900 a year for the 1%. Further breaking down from the same exact tax bill, when you go into that 1%, and you can do this if you were to go online, when you type in that 82007 for this specific property and the tax rate area they're in in Bethel Island, it tells you very clearly how your 1% is divided up and where your services go. All of the services that you receive in Bethel Island, if they're county services, special district services, school services, if you use them or not, you're still assessed on them. You may not have kids, you may not have had kids for a long time, you're like 44%, that's how it works. And yes, East Contra Costa Fire does get 18.45% on average within the Bethel Island area, that is a fact. And we are aware and we understand that and you are part of the overall system but everyone throughout the whole jurisdiction pays that 1%. So to break it down a little bit even further, is this an example is, it's also important to note that that 1% comes off your assessed values, your tax bill value, not, not your, what you believe to be the market value of your home. And that's an important key point. The market value of your home is not the assessed value of your home. So using the example of $166,000 assessed value, and it goes up, maybe 2% each year if it's above that, is that the ad valorem we just previously discussed, that 1% is $1,600, which means in your 18%, $140 comes to the fire district of your whole tax bill, even if your market value is 520,000. So it's very important to understand that assessed values, tax bill values is not market values. People believe they are, okay? But the 1% comes into the district. Furthermore, Bethel Island as a whole, this is, the, this is really a key point that I need us all to look at, is the 18% is not the whole story with the revenue in Bethel Island. In 2018, there was 453 um, million worth of the tax bill value of the properties in Bethel Island. And the 1% ad valorem rate was 4,530,000. And I get all the time is give us our money back, let us start our own fire department. You guys are not doing anything for us. And I, I understand those optics, but all of Bethel Island entirely brings in $837,000 a year to the fire district. I've been challenged on, well, what about Delta Coves? Delta Coves is gonna be great. Delta Coves homes are gonna be about a million dollars. There's hundreds of them that are probably gonna be built. And we do anticipate starting about five years to the next 10 years, an additional million will come into the district. It is fantastic. But if you, let's just make the assumption that that revenue is coming into the district today. That means Delta Coast is fully built out, all hundreds of those homes. That gives us, and let's say this was done in 18, so let's say just $2 million is coming into the district. It's a key point to understand that it costs $4.5 million a year to operate a fire station. It costs $800,000 to buy one fire engine and another $200,000 to fully equip it, a million dollars, to buy a fire engine last 10 years. And the revenue that comes in from Bethel Island, the 1%, the, the percentage is more. And I also wanna make it very clear, no one call is more important to another and no one resident is important to another. Everyone is equal and the same and we wanna treat and, and serve everyone equally and the same. The challenge that we have is everyone's charged 1% and throughout the district, the percentages are different, but the revenue that comes in the district is not enough. So in Brentwood, the tax rate areas are on average 6.48, Oakley 5.5, 505, Discovery Bay on average, because the multiple tax rate areas is 18.3, Bethel Island is 18.45, Knights in 602, and there's other areas, that's a disclaimer down there, our revenue is a lot more than 11 million, but this is just an example that the revenues that are brought in from everywhere are not enough. Everybody 
needs to bring additional revenue into the district to get us where we need to go. So it, I understand the optics of the 1% and how it's divided up. Everyone pays the same 1% on their assessed value of the home. And there's just not enough revenue coming into the fire district to be able to address that. So again, there's over 200, 200 tax rate areas. That shows you how to get the information, they understand the information, understanding that in, in 10 years, the Bethel Island community is gonna bring in 2 million to the district. Bethel Island is, a very, is equally as important as everywhere throughout our jurisdiction. We have a system issue. We have a system issue. And we have to correct the system to provide not only Bethel Island, but every community better services. I'm gonna talk about response times a little bit, changing gears, and there's questions on that, I welcome them. The response times in the Bethel Island are not adequate. The response times in Bethel Island need to be better, but I wanna be clear, the response times throughout the whole jurisdiction need to be better and are not adequate. And let me, let me help explain. In 2019, 357 calls came to service specifically Bethel Island. We ran 7,719 calls, 357 of them were in Bethel Island. We averaged a call a day, 30 a month. The average response time is 14 minutes and 38 seconds. And Bethel Island is about 5% of all of the calls that we run. And each one of those calls is critically important to us. I just wanna understand that they're critically important but it's 5% of the calls we make. But the response times are a bigger issue, and this is where I'm hoping we can see where we have a system issue. It's not a Bethel Island issue, it's a system issue. We have many, many days, I'm sorry, many calls of which that we are unavailable for. All of our units are committed, we cannot respond. We have to call another agency. If another agency is not available, it's an ambulance only. There's many calls throughout the whole system. What's even more shocking is 25% of the 7,700 calls throughout the whole system, we get canceled to while we're responding to it because it takes us so long to get there. The whole system, 25% of our calls, we are dispatched and before we arrive at scene, we are canceled. And they have to adapt and overcome and it's a disservice to the people that are being treated and the, and the response times are delayed. And the point I'm trying to make here not to get to call to call to call, your average response time should be closer to half of what it is. I agree and station 55 will quickly start to rectify that. But the points I wanna make is the response times are not just a Bethel Island issue. I understand why it's perceived that way because respectfully you live there and that, that, that's where you are. But every community is very frustrated about what response times are and they're critical. I also want to hit on a very specific other issues uh, real quick here and I'll transfer to Chief Albert when we get the hazard abatement and the dry hydrants. Volunteers, again, I came from that cut. I was molded from it. I was also the battalion chief in charge of volunteers for a very long time. I held on and managed that program uh, until the early 2000s. And there are many, many reasons why the volunteer system does not work within our area. There is a legal, not a legal analysis, there's a press release that we did, which if you go to the district's website and go to our press releases and scroll down, it lets you, it's my story of explaining why volunteering doesn't work. I do a better job articulating it there, but let me just give you the cliff note version here and reference that if you wanna talk more online about it, we can. It isn't that we're anti-volunteer. I wanna be very clear about that. Many of us, President Oftedal, myself, we came from them. But what we found to get to the end, I'll work my way back, is we were, we were competing with the community college district. We were a stepping stone. People that want to be volunteers want to be career firefighters these days. The reason being is historically laws were different. Today, if you want to be a volunteer, you got to be trained to the same degree as a professional firefighter. You got to go through a fire academy, you got to get an EMT, you got 240 hours a year of training. Volunteers also to fire agencies are not free. They come at a cost, there's workers comp, there's oversight, there's training and there's equipping and the turnover rate is crazy. We learned and we invested into, and we invested hundreds of thousands of dollars of training people to come and get enough experience to get a job elsewhere. Furthermore, we realized at the same time, the community college district was doing the same thing. They were bringing people in, getting through an academy and sending them elsewhere. So we have a play in place if we had additional stations and additional administrative staff to be able to manage what we have to do, to go into partnership 
with the community colleges to put a trainee on our engines to get them the knowledge and experience to get their checkbook signed off and train them. And it also gives us an opportunity to check out the new talent to see if they're somebody we'd want to invest into in the future in our hiring processes. But when we get done training them, they go, they go back to the pool. We go back to the pool. The community college carries a liability. They equip them. They train them. We evaluate. Them. So we have a play to be able to increase, but um, being able to maintain a volunteer system, um, people don't volunteer like they used to. Our community is different than they used to. It doesn't, it doesn't fill the mark. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, station 9555. Again, we aren't just haphazardly and not thinking this through. It's very strategic. The fire district owns the station 95. We are in the process of selling that station in the very near future. In, in a month or so, that station is going to be sold. And it's going to be go back into maintaining and also building additional stations within the system. It was intended for station 55 to replace station 95. And it isn't that we're selling a station for something that doesn't exist. We're selling a station for one that you can tangibly go down and touch that does exist. That, so again, I, I want to be clear that it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't not thought about. It wasn't have been thought through. We want to staff that station to service the island and be able to serve the jurisdiction. The jurisdiction, 250 square miles, positioning and placement of stations is important. And, and where we place it and where it is, it's not as ideal as we would like, but it's okay. It works. It can work in our system. We're making it work and it's there. So I understand that people want to hold on to that station, but the station for the fire district is a liability, not an asset. And we have one that is replaced and we're, we're ready to staff it when revenue comes in to service that, that and the whole jurisdiction. The fire boat. I used to operate that fire boat. I worked that fire boat, trained on that fire boat. I love the fire boat. Our members love the fire boat. But here's the deal. The deal is, is that we can't even do well with the right amount of resources of what we do 90% of the time. We ran less than one fire boat call a month. One fire, that's 12 calls per year. No more than 18 calls per year on the fire boat. We can't even respond to a residential structure fire. So to be clear, the fire boat isn't the only thing that has been put in staging. All special operations in our fire district have been put in staging. We don't have a truck, a ladder truck, to go above two stories. That's the next piece of equipment that we need to get. We don't have enough engines to fulfill a, a basic residential structure fire. We're not doing trench rescues, confined space, hazardous materials. We will isolate, deny, and identify and create a safe environment and rescue when we can. And otherwise, we have to call upon other, other specialized units from other agencies. So as an interim, as a step, what we've done is we've transferred the boat over to Contra Costa County Fire that is able to staff and train adequately. And when we need them, they call us, they, they come. It doesn't impact our automatic aid numbers because they utilize the resources and they work with us. Is it ideal? No but we don't have the baseline services to do what we do well and we can't do specialized services. If you can't do what you do 90% of the time well, you gotta cut back on what you do. And that's what it is. So it isn't a matter of not wanting to, not wanting to invest into, we don't have the capabilities to. And training on the boat program, it's a specialized piece of equipment. It's very technical, it takes a lot of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transfer it over to Chief Albert. Um, I'm gonna have the slides, but, uh, and then we're gonna be working to closing on these topics. I know I've gone long, but I'm trying to get it all out there and we can do a Q&A to continue. But uh, Chief Albert, do you mind coming in and providing an update on uh, hazard abatement and dry hydrants, please? Sure. Thank you, Chief. Uh, everyone can you hear me okay? Very good. Good. All right. So hazard abatement has been a uh, long time uh, desire of the district uh, to kind of give you a brief overview of how we got to that point right now. Uh, all the way up until almost the end of 2018, all of our fire prevention services were being actually handled uh, through contract services with Contra Costa County Fire Protection District. Uh, towards the end of 2018, we received notice that they could no longer support that level of services and contract with uh, East Contra Costa Fire. And uh, we had to uh, quickly ramp up and be able to adapt and overcome and come up with a way that we could continue to provide fire prevention services throughout the district. Uh, these include uh, both inspections of new construction, uh, existing occupancies that are required to be inspected once on an annual basis, 
and of course the hazard abatement portion of uh, the program. Hazard abatement notoriously uh, had been kind of a low priority based off of you know how many resources we had. Uh, back in May of 2019 when I came on board uh, that was one of the primary things that we uh, were just walking into the first uh, hazard abatement, weed abatement season uh, that I had an opportunity to be a part of. Uh, in doing that, we had a lot of stuff we had to put into place. There is a lot of legal requirements that is outlined in both the California Health and Safety Code and as well as in California Fire Code. Uh, we've been working diligently over this past year to actually set the foundation to give us the authority to be able to go in and be able to mitigate those hazards uh, appropriately and you know, actually quickly in the future. As you all well know, you received a letter from uh, my office uh, identifying exactly, you know, hey, everybody had, here's the standards, here's the timelines, here's what you had to do to abate those hazards. And that actually set forth uh, the ability in the future to be able to eliminate for those properties that we know have a annual continual issue with those uh, processes. So we'll be able to streamline that process as we move forward into next season as well too. But very clearly, there are a number of different steps that are outlined by law that we have to go through, notify the property owners, give them every opportunity to be able to mitigate those hazards on their own before the district actually steps in, turns those over to our abatement contractor, and then uh, we we're actually able to come back after that point Get approval from our board and be able to lien the property to be able to recoup the cost of how much it costs to pay those out. That is not our primary desi desire to go down that road. Our primary desire is actually to inform and educate and change the understanding of the property owners of why it's so necessary to mitigate those threats. Uh, along with that is part of the prevention group is uh, fire investigations. As we've gone out and we've done a number of different fire investigations over this past year, uh, that is one thing that we actually take into account. And, you know, technically we can come back and if you have not mitigated your property and we do feel that it was a threat, we can actually identify that through the investigation process as well. And there could be, you know, further repercussions from that as well too. Uh, that's kind of a, a quick down and dirty synopsis of our hazard abatement program where we're at. Um, last year we kind of did a recap. We had five different parcels that we took all the way through the process. This year uh, I am happy and pleased to say that, you know, not just from Bethel Island, but all the way throughout the district, we're seeing more abatement on more properties than we ever have in, out of this entire district. Uh, it is a community effort. There are a lot of parcels that, you know, we just don't have the resources or haven't been brought to our attention. And it does take a community effort to, you know, make it a safer place. That is why that, you know, we created the uh, East Contra Costa Fire Protection District app that's available uh, that you can download on your phones. and make it very easy to, if you do come across a parcel, it's tall weeds, it's been a threat, you've been concerned about it, you can jump on that app and you can actually automatically notify the Prevention Bureau, and we'll take up, you know, begin the inspection process from there. We can't be everywhere, of course, and that is strictly why it does take that community approach to make it a safer environment for all. Uh, moving into dry hydrants. Dry hydrants, uh, notoriously back in the day, uh, as we well know, hasn't been much of any type of municipal water uh, in, on the island. Uh, we had very few areas that had hydrants. And the dry hydrants was a concept and idea that was brought forward as a potential source that could be a, an alternate means of, you know, getting water from, you know, on top of the levees and out from the delta. Uh, there are a number of different challenges when it comes to the dry hydrants. Uh, while the concept and the idea is great, uh, the full entire program as it relates that there's a number of different groups that have their hands in this. Uh, one is the, the maintenance aspect when it comes to a dry hydrant. According to National Fire Protection Association standards, of which those dry hydrants were installed, there's also a maintenance component piece out of there. Uh, the one part that we can't help with is that we don't have, uh, we're, we're not certified and licensed to work on hydrants like that. 
Uh, those are actually designated people who carry a specific license as identified by the state and they're certified to work on all type of fires, you know, suppression systems, hydrants, uh, and anything along those lines. We do not carry that. And there's a reason why, because we are actually more or less a quality assurance when it comes to those type of systems. We evaluate, we support and provide the technical expertise of what those standards are that you're trying to uh, match up with and meet. The second part of the dry hydrant issue is an access issue. Uh, through Bivin has the authority over all the levy tops out there. Uh, that has continued to always be a challenge and that where we've had a number of different incidents where we tried to put an engine up on top and they were actually getting stuck in the mud. You know, the levy tops are supposed to be designed that they're all weather access. They're fully clear that we can actually drive on top of the levy tops, provide emergency level support uh, if the need actually arose. Uh, so those are the two main challenges when it comes to dry hydrants. And what I would add is that it's not that we won't use them. It's a matter of, it's not gonna be our primary source because we do need to rely on primary sources of water that's gonna be able to sustain the firefighting operations that we're up against when we're going out onto the island. That is through a number of different ways where we bring in the water tenders. Uh, now we actually have some hydrants that are a little bit closer by so the turnaround times for the water tenders to be able to, uh, you know, refuel the, uh, the tanks and get back out there is much quicker. But we will always use the dry hydrants as an alternate level of a water suppression system if we have the access and we have the time to be able to get an engine up there safely and be able to see if we can actually put something into place. So it's not gonna be a primary, but it's definitely in our line of business it is always adapt and overcome. And we will always keep that as an option as long as they're there. Now, you know, the biggest part about dry hydrants out there right now for the community is what does the community want? Does the community want to maintain that level of system? Do they want to invest in that system? And if so, we uh, are more than willing to kind of open it up and bring, you know, together the different parties involved, both the community the uh, water service purveyors out there, uh, and then Bimin as well too. And we will provide the technical level of expertise to guide everybody down that road of what truly is required, but that's gonna be a community decision amongst all those different groups that that is something that you guys will actually want to invest in and move into the future. And if not, if that's something that, you know, you'd rather invest your time and money in elsewhere, then, you know, we'd probably recommend actually taking out those hydrants because if they're not being maintained, they're not gonna be a reliable source and they could be, you know, most potentially fail on us in the middle of a firefight out there on the properties. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, uh, Chief Albert. Um, so look, I also wanna be clear on a couple of things. This is never intended to be um, all, everything said. So we understand conversations need to continue. We welcome more questions. We may have even said some things tonight that some people aren't, aren't favorable of per se, but I hope that you know that everything we're saying is, is, is factual, it's relevant, and it's true. And I think that's what's important because there's so much misinformation out in the district. Um, uh, in regards to upcoming events, I know we're gonna be talking about this later, but tonight we're here in Bethel Island. We have Discovery Bay, Marsh Creek, Morgan Territory, and Byron where we're doing virtual town halls. We have multiple Facebook Live events coming up talking about specific topics and questions. Some of those have already passed. Uh, look for those on our, our, our website and our Facebook page. Here's Chief uh, Albert's and my contact information. That's my cell phone, his cell phone, and our email addresses. And the website has a ton of information out there uh, for us. Before I give this back to uh, President Offendahl to go into a question and answer session, I want to leave with this. I want you guys to know sincerely and wholeheartedly, and if you know me, I think you understand the truth and the merit and the sincerity of what I'm laying down here is that I'm not, I want what you want. The fire board wants what you want. And if I could make it happen and if I could just do it, it would be done, but it is really, really hard. And also again, the, the challenges that you feel and the challenges that you see, I'm going to get it to the next community I go to and they're not unique to you. It's all of us being hit by this. So 
I hope this doesn't come across as selfish by any stretch, but again, it's like, I want to work with you. I'm not your enemy. I, I try to make myself accessible on social media, Facebook. I, I, I talk to many, many, many people in the community and I'll continue to do so and make myself accessible to you regardless of what's been said or what's done. I will he be here to serve you. I'm your fire chief. We are a, he's your fire marshal. We are your fire board. We are here to serve you and try to correct this, but we need help. We need support. So thank you for being engaged, stay in the conversation. And I appreciate this opportunity to get a global perspective on where we are. And even though you may not like some of the things we had to say because of the reality of it and the gravity of it, at least you have the truth. So President Oftel, thank you for the opportunity. I'm concluded. Nice, thank you so much, Steve. And it sounds like a little bit of feedback in the background. Uh, there we go, I've lost it. But uh, thank you so much. And I'm, I wanna open it right up to uh, questions because we do really wanna hear from the community. And uh, Susanna, do we have any questions at this point? Um, right now, I don't have any questions, but um, a lot of people are on their phone. So if you're on your phone and you'd like to ask, ask a question, um, you can hit star six to unmute yourself and star nine to raise your hand. Um, and the star six works to mute and unmute. Question. Um, so questions. Oh, Lisa Novak, you have a question. Go My ahead. husband is taking it away. Hey, All right. I just want to, I want to ask the fire chief or the fire president. I've worked in the U.S. Air Force and the Air Force Reserve for over 22 years. We had problems, again, with funding. And we used war reserve material, which means essentially for you guys, why are we staffing everything with brand new vehicles? Why are we not using some surplus material to staff the fire engines or to, to put into the, into the fire stations? And then you have the opportunity to pay your firefighters what they're worth. Every time I hear something, it's I've got a million dollar fire truck, as opposed to, hey, we have some, in my terms, it's war reserve material. In yours, it would be, I have a used fire truck that we got from Moraga, or maybe you got it from Kansas, but at least it's functional. The fire, the fire engines have a, have a life, I'm sure, when they're well-maintained. We're still using C5As and C5Bs from 1968. Why is the fire department not trying to do it that way to make their funding a little bit better? Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you for your service. And I think what you raise is a very fair question. And I do see the perspective that you have. And I think that some things I want to highlight is historically, the fire district hasn't invested into what is called the capital equipment replacement plan. Like we just, we hadn't, we hadn't replaced. And the equipment that we're using right now we do intend to have frontline apparatus that is not used apparatus because it is not as reliable, but we do use our frontline apparatus becomes our backup apparatus. I mean, we historically have always done that. We lease our equipment. We don't buy it all outright just in one shot. We invest slowly into it over a time. Um, there's also something that has to do a lot with technology, the type of the equipment, the capabilities of the equipment. There's a lot of value in the new engines that we have in regards to capabilities. And so we don't, we don't pay all that cash just all at once. It is something we invest into slowly over time. And the intent is that every time we buy a piece of equipment, another one goes into reserve. And as another piece of equipment goes in reserve and the one falls off. So the, the practice that we have, again, we invest a small portion. It is not a large portion of our budget every year into a facilities and a capital equipment replacement plan. We invest into that. And it is done incrementally over a 10 year process and we do lease it. And we believe we have a very efficient way of doing that. What I would say, Mr. Uh, Novak, I believe it is, if I mispronounced that, I do apologize, is what I would be more than happy to do is uh, I welcome you to sit down, not only with myself, but our finance director, um, our, our chair of our finance committee, uh, Director Joe Young. Um, we have been, when I came in again, we did not, we were deferring all of our equipment replacement. We were deferring all of our facility maintenance. And when I walked in, most of our equipment was at year 10. We were at a critical position. And so we're doing a small investment every year 
And the challenge we have right now, and I know the community sees it, and it's so hard. There's, there's two things that I want to build on beyond that you didn't even say. I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of criticism, and I get the optics of it, and I understand, is that we're replacing a ton of equipment. We're rehabbing a bunch of our stations on the capital side because everything was either falling apart or it hadn't been invested into for over 10 years. And you're not going to see us reinvesting for another 10 years. But we are incrementally good at doing it so stuff doesn't fall out of disrepair. And so right now, we are, stat we are essentially over the past three years rebuilding a fire department. And we have to invest into the fire. And I do believe the way we're doing is very financially wise. But buying second-hand equipment provides secondary issues. And I, and I do know because I have a little familiarity with the military, I, I think that we both know that the, the reliability of equipment sometimes is a challenge and the challenges that we have. So again, I think there's a lot of ways of looking at the business model. I will tell you that we're not sacrificing long-term sustainability of hiring firefighters to invest into. I think this is the key point. We are not sacrificing our equipment and ca our capital equipment replacement plan in lieu of hiring a firefighter for 30 years. That's not, okay, that's not the issue. I would like to comment on that in that I work in Brentwood. We have an in inspector come out a month or so ago in brand new F whatever four pickup trucks, two of them. That's correct. Is that, is that necessary for them to show up in brand new trucks to do an inspection on our single one fire extinguisher in the building? It's a frustrating image thing that, that we're seeing here. Like, really? I'll handle that one if you don't mind. Yeah, please. So, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Novak, yeah. So, and, and we understand completely, and, and those are brand new pieces of equipment that uh, as we build up this, you know, fire prevention division, uh, you know, like, like we said, there, there are mandatory inspections that are required by law that we actually have to get out and go, and go do that. Now, as we build out this, you know, division, and we've hired on new staff like that, there is a training element that we're also working through as well too. So the reason why sometimes you're seeing those two inspectors come out there is not just for the opportunity to actually go inspect just maybe one fire extinguisher, but actually the, the training opportunity to understand what the proper procedures are to make contact, to you know, make the documentation and to do that, those services. Before we never had a fire inspector and all of East Contra Costa Fire Protection District. So we didn't even need one of those vehicles to support that kind of, you know, uh, level of uh, services. Those are, again, all done by Contra Costa County. They had their own vehicles that they drove out here with. And I can tell you, because I transferred from out there, is that, you know, we had brand new vehicles as well that were coming into that district as well, too. Uh, and they got rotated out every few years. Uh, more so when it comes to our fire engines, you know, there's a National Fire Protection Association standard for those as well, too. And those are typically with a 15-year lifespan uh, for each of those engines. Ten years spending uh, as a frontline piece of equipment with the five years as a uh, backup, you know, resource that we can uh, put into play. Uh, for example, our current equipment that we have right now uh, are you know, coming from as early as 2001, 2002, and then the earliest one we have is from 2007. And these are showing anywhere between 160,000 miles on them to 175,000 miles on each of those pieces of equipment. In uh, I also started off from the Air Force. I was in fire protection as well. We didn't put that many miles on our equipment out there uh, ever on, on an annual basis or even in a 10 year span time frame. So hopefully that answers your question, um, but uh, I'm more than happy to address anything else. And look, what I would like to do to, so, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Novak, what, what I want to say is this, is that I, I understand the optics, but I, period. I, I understand the optics. What, what I want to say is that we, we don't make these decisions in a silo and they're very thought through and they're calculated on making a sustainable, organization to be able to provide all the services that we're doing and many of them are new 
we, we make these decisions in public. We do this through finance committees. We, we get an approval through the board. We have a long-term plan. And we are not choosing equipment and sustainability over people. It's part of the, the three station. And if we increase revenue and the cost of the stations to increase, it's part of the system plan. And so I, I, I'm more than willing to talk more offline about it. But I, I do believe that we are not operating in a manner of which isn't standard with the industry of which we're in to be, to be sustainable and also doing the best we can with the resources and funds we have. We're not being reckless with our funds. You're on mute, I'm sorry, I think you're on mute. Excuse me, I, I, we can't hear you, you're on mute. You're, you're on mute. There you Hello? go. So I, I, I think the problem that, I don't know if, if you've got me now or not, because now I've got a phone no, in front of my- No, I got but, you, we got you. But I'll do it. But it, 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 maybe it's a systemic issue with the fire department. I hear your, your issues with, the, with maybe the city council or the county and how they're assessing stuff. But to me, it seems like the fire department here, and maybe it's the fire department everywhere, needs to operate a little more like a private industry. I don't have the opportunities. I'm a manager as well. I don't have the opportunity to go out and buy brand new equipment every time there's an issue. I need to figure it out and make it work. And I think that's where the fire department, whether it's East Costa County, East Costa County, County or some other place, needs to figure that out. You have a budget. Do you right. need to, when you bring people out, does everybody have to take a break right away? It's a California rule, I get it, but do they need a 15 minute break, 15 minutes after they come to a fire? We saw that on Taylor Road, and that's really my issue. My best friend was a fire captain at Half Moon Bay. At this point, I really, really dislike the fire department because of the actions that we saw down at the end. There were three houses that were lost. I'm upset. None of them were mine. None of them were even my friends. He was the but, first one on scene. But we lost at least one house more than we should have. And something should have been done there. It's an image issue with the fire department. And when you come up with new equipment and you come up with whatever, a, a second vehicle that's only supplying, I'm going to say what my wife would say, it only supplies clip bars for snacks. We saw it Unlike, firsthand in a Yeti. That's, that's BS. There's no reason for that. You guys, you guys, and, and I'm sorry, that's a generalization. That's not fair. But I'm going to say the fire department, when I see them come out, I'm like, really? Show me a little bit of hustle. Show me a little bit of, my God, you know, I've been at the fire station. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm tired, but I want to put your fire out. I'm they not were, seeing it. They were strolling. We've had a fire at our house since that time. You guys showed up. My husband had just gotten off the phone with the insurance company filing our claim. We That's how done. long it took. We, we had put one it out at the ourselves. end of the road as well, at the end of Taylor Road. And we virtually put it out before the fire department even showed up. It, it's just, I, I'm frustrated and I'm, and I'm sorry, and I, I feel your heart. I really do. I, I hear what you're saying, that you feel like you're hamstrung, but somebody has to do something. Somebody has to make a decision that says, hey, instead of the million dollar piece of equipment, we're going to go out and buy something else. And maybe it fails on the way in. And then you can say, hey, you know, we did the best we could with our, with our budget, but you know, halfway to Bessel Island, it, it, it failed. I Sir, with all that. due respect, that has happened. We, we no. did do that. And we ran, we ran, our members ran by foot to a cardiac arrest. It happened. I, I would, yeah, I, I get it. Well, no, but that, I'm saying with, I mean, respectfully, what you're saying we should do, we've experienced. It, it made the okay. news. It was all over. It made national news. Our members, and they actually made the cardiac arrest save over at the, um, right there off a of lone tree across from Chuck E. Cheese. The, the, the engine broke down in the Chuck E. Cheese parking lot. Sure. Well, maybe a little more, more maintenance than, I don't know what to tell you. 
you you got a difficult job. I get it. I'm just I, I'm expressing my my frustration on this. And I, and I welcome and I I sympathize with you and I I do hear you. And the optics they do concern me. And I mean again, I welcome you to act to participate. But we make these decisions in 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 community, right? And so I, I'm not making these haphazardly and I do care and I'm I'm sad like you are but and I and it disappoints me that it comes across that we're not doing the best we can I know our members I know our members families I know what I strive for I don't want to disappoint anybody I don't want to disappoint you I'm disappointed you're disappointed and I try every day to do the best I can with what we have and it, it's very complex there's so many dynamic and components to this it's not just this is one piece of a million piece puzzle and I hear you loud and clear, and, and I just want to let you know to re also give other people the opportunity is number one, I'd welcome this conversation more. And number two, I'm not just dismissing what you're saying. And I guess number three is I care. And I don't think I'll be able to satisfy your concerns here tonight, but I want to continue to work with you to either see things that we're doing or adapt recommendations you have, but we're, we are in a tough environment. So I, I sincerely hear you um, and I'm struggling with what to do with it. To be honest, and Chief, maybe we can uh, maybe we can schedule an offline sit down. Absolutely, I welcome it. Talk and and I'm uh, I've got a little bit of an ask, maybe just so we can try to get it back on track. We can try to schedule that sit down with them uh, after the fact. But then also maybe you could uh, maybe you could separate kind of two of the issues, kind of the way that I'm hearing it. It still sounds like uh, we need to do a better job explaining the Prevention Bureau funding, the sort sure. of the zero sum game versus the operational funding. And then also maybe we could just go into a little bit of the, uh, the acquisition of station 55 and that we have the station, we have the apparatus or the funding for the apparatus that came with that agreement, the city of Oakley and Shea Holmes agreement. That's correct. And, uh, we're ready to go live with it. It's more of an operational sustainability funding issue. So maybe if you could just hit those two target points. Yeah, so there's, you know, the, the Fire Prevention Bureau, just to be clear, there's the way that it works is that uh, the services through uh, inspections and otherwise, it, it's a cost recovery type program. So the, we have not only the inspections uh, that are completed, there's, there's fees for service, and there's things that they do for community risk reduction that we do what is called the cost recovery mechanism through that. And again, it is a new, it's a brand new bureau, it's a brand new division. Um, everything that we do from equipment to personnel to our supplies, even a portion of my time, because I do invest into that bureau is, is cost recovered too. Um, but that it is a cost neutral program. Um, it, is, it is meant to balance itself out. We can't make any, it's not profit generating. It is just neutralizing in regards to funding uh, the fire prevention bureau and, and the services they provide for community risk reduction. So, um, that is on that side. Now, 55 um, was um, funded uh, primarily through Shea Homes. Um, we had also put, we invested into the building of a tune of 1.9 million to be able to get it where it needed to be uh, to finish the construction. But we're also getting reimbursed that money over a five to 10 year window um, through impact fees that come into the district. So the money is coming back into uh, the organization. So we own the fire station. Uh, that is an asset of the fire station. We do have money that is in staging that is uh, available to go uh, from that developer uh, to purchase a piece of equipment if we uh, to be able to build it out um, so again i you know i struggle with what we previously discussed um, again i the way that we approach our finances we've been very we've scrutinized ourselves we have looked at it we are looking at long-term investments in things um, and I think that we're being reasonable and wise, um, but, I, but I'm going to continue to share and look. And I, I, again, I just want Mr. or Ms. Novak not to go back to around the block, but I, I appreciate their, their comments. I hear them loud and clear. And so, um, but I will stand behind saying that we are not um, haphazardly making decisions. We do analyze these, look them through industry best practices, make wise decisions, and we know we, we work in a very transparent and open, our, our finance meetings, like I say, are open to the public. Our board meetings are open to the public. They're recorded. 
we agendize, we speak about all purchases in the organization. Um, so I, I hear I hear this loud and clear, but there there are budget works. There's restricted money. There's non-restricted money. There's cost recovery money. Uh, our finances on that side are, are somewhat complex. Um, but I hope that answers your uh, question, President Alton. Uh, I, I hope that was helpful for the, the Novax. I know uh, it seemed as if we probably needed to clarify the separation between that. Uh, that w was that helpful for you at all, or is that still keeping us in the same spot? And, and not to speak for the Novax, but I, and let me speak clearly. What I'm hearing is they, uh, and I, and and please forgive me in advance. My intent is not to speak for you because. You can you, you spoke for yourself, but I think the optics of us building the fire department, having service level challenges, but yet having new equipment and being able to reinforce the infrastructure, but not increase service levels. And the question is, are we, are we spending our money as wisely as we should? And if we, if we did not use the monies to buy equipment in the manner of which we are, or there's other ways, um, can you do it better? And, and I think that's a fair criticism. And I think it's something that as the fire board and myself as our, and our staff, we should always strive to do financially better. We're, we're, what I'm saying to myself in my head right now is a lot of the reasons why we don't make those compromises is because we transfer the problem from one place to the next. Like, although we may save some money, we've caused another operational challenge per se. And, and each decision is very unique to itself. So, I just want to be clear that um, I, want, I want everyone to be proud of what we do. I want you to be proud of your fire department. I want you to think we're physically sound. We're making sound decisions and I'm hearing you that you don't. And so we, we've tried to be as transparent as we can, as authentic as we can and accessible as we can. Um, and I, I need to think about what we can do, if anything at all, um, to do better. But I, I felt over the past three years that we, we have done a good job using the resources we have to build a solid fire organization to provide the services we can. So again, I don't wanna go around the block again, but I hear you. And Lisa, I dropped my email address in chat for you if you wanna continue the conversation. Thank you. Cool, um, any more questions? And, and to be clear, okay. I don't, I welcome these types of questions, they're fair. This is what we need to do. You need to unmute. There you go. Uh, good evening. Um, I just wanted to get a clarification regarding the $1.9 million loan um, to finish off 55. So it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the district loaned the city of Oakley $1.9 million. Um, why was that done? Um, did the city of Oakley not have the funds to finish off the station itself? Um, and you said five to 10 years. Um, what is the actual length of the loan being that, you know, the district is in a financial um, conundrum? We could use $2 million. Yeah, no, I think that, well, there's a couple of things that we need to take into consideration when you think about that transaction. Now that, that whole uh, Summer Lakes uh, project um, and uh, the Station 55, it, it was a long time. Uh, there was some litigation that occurred. It actually is being finalized when I came into the fire district. So. To put things in appropriate perspective is when the station was built, uh, we had about three and a half million, maybe more, between three and a half to four million dollars from the developer to be able to construct the station. I, when I came into the fire district as a fire chief, the amount of revenue, the, the three and a half to four million dollars that we had would not have built the adequate structure that we needed. And I need to find a way to get the revenue to get a station that would be adequate. And to be clear is the two station, uh, the two apparatus bay and the station we have, it's a very functional, it's gonna be a good station, but it's not, that the lot doesn't provide it, uh, but it's not ideally as big um, as we would like station 53 in Oakley. So it is a good station, don't get me wrong, but it is just not the footprint of the land and the station is not as big. So the revenue we got from the developer, we could have built the station with the revenues they had, but I was trying to look well into the future and I realized we needed to bigger station to be able to do all the duties out of a station that we need. So as we approached and tried to work through that challenge with the city of Oakley, um, the answer to another part of your question is there was not enough impact fees available within their system. And that's, that's one of the antiquated impact fee challenges we have, right? And that's why we're going to update it because 
there wasn't enough for the stations then. And if we stay there, there wouldn't be enough stations for the future. And so what we did is we tried to creatively find a way to fund it. So we at the previously, we have one-time monies. We have reserves. We have monies beyond our reserves. We have one-time monies that can't be used for sustainable operations because they're not reoccurring funds. They're kind of in savings, if that makes sense. What we decided to do is we made the agreement that, hey, listen, we'll invest 1.9 of our one-time funds into the building, but we want to own the building outright. It's not going to be a city of Brentwood building. When it's doing the construction's done, the permits are signed off, and the construction is done, it's going to transfer from the city into the district. So we essentially, as the fire district, bought a station for $1.9 million, which is a really good deal. In return, we also said that future impact fees that were collected, right, are going to come back to the district. Now, why is this important? It's because impact fees are restricted funds. The monies that we use were unrestricted funds to pay for. And that's a key point. The reason we want to make sure the mechanism reimburses us, we can go back and use it as unrestricted funds. So we had to do, we can get it through the impact fees. They're going to be unrestricted. And it was a creative way essentially to get the station we wanted and done. So I don't want to say exactly. So the trickle amount of the amount of the impact fees coming in to get us back to where we go to use them unrestricted wise, we receive the monies quarterly as they come in. So it's hard for me to give you like a date per se, because if building increases or building slows down, it, it will increase and slow down. So um, we, I, I can, uh, Mr. Keller, I, I, we can talk offline and give you like an update on like what's flowed in, right? And then at the rate of which it's coming in. Um, but that is, that's the accurate information I have for you tonight. And I hope that provides some clarity on why we did. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good question. Great. Um, thanks, Ben. Any other questions? Um, raise your hand or just unmute your mic and yes, identify I yourself. Have, yes, I and have could questions. Could you identify yourself hear me? Um, yes, yes I can hear Mitch. you. Okay, my Hi. name is Mitch. Um, my hi, Mitch. Go ahead Mitch. and ask your question. Okay. So, um, I read the initiative that was put forward by a uh, Brentwood resident uh, for uh, improved fire services using existing funds from the city of Brentwood. And I've also read the 9212 report that the city had done to analyze that. And so what I see is that the use of any fire or medical assessment money that comes out of Brentwood it can't be restricted only to be used in Brentwood. And since the service needs extend to Oakley and unincorporated parts of the county, it seems like a solution and funding for the fire and emergency medical service problems needs to include both cities of Oakley, Brentwood, the fire district, the affected county areas all working together. Now, I know there have been prior fire district funding measures that have gone to the ballot and those have failed <clears throat> more than once. And from what I saw with those, there did not appear to be a good public education or outreach campaign done prior to those efforts going to the ballot. I do know that there are other cities that have been successful in passing tax measures, either property tax or sales tax to fund uh, services. And my knowledge of those is there was a really good public education effort done prior to that. So I look at my property tax bill and the only emergency medical paramedic fire related fee I see is emergency med B, $10 a year. That's a Contra Costa countywide assessment passed in 1998. It's distributed to agencies for paramedic service throughout the county, including the ECC FPD. Now, I don't wanna pay more taxes. Um, nobody does, especially in these difficult times. This $10 fee is the second smallest assessment on my property tax bill. So uh, one, I have several questions. And the first is, and I'll, I'll go through these, 
what is the most recent estimate that's been done by the fire district or the cities, the district and the county unincorporated working together for the cost uh, of an annual fire emergency medical assessment for a typical single family homeowner if the costs were spread to all property owners in the fire district service area, including the two cities and the impacted unincorporated county. And then also has a sales tax increase estimate been done to determine what increase would be needed to improve the fire and emergency medical services within both cities in the unincorporated county. And again, it just, it seems like um, really either a new, or if there is one, an amended joint powers authority is appropriate for equitably funding the necessary improvements of fire and emergency medical services in the both cities and the county together. Um, so, you know, what is planned for the ballot in November? I think the, the fire district and the cities and the unincorporated county need to join together and be proactive. If you're gonna let these reactive citizens initiatives come forward, that aren't realistic, um, you know, if they pass, they could put draconian, restrictive, unrealistic measures in place that just aren't gonna work. So, um, and I do see there's a county half cent sales tax measure on the ballot already in November. Uh, and I understand it's hard to do another measure at the same time. So, you know, my question is, uh, once I've listed, what what is the district doing with the cities to take a proactive leadership position to educate the public on the lack of fire and emergency medical service here and the best ways that we can finance our life safety, which is probably one of the most, which is definitely the most important service we have. Um, I'm a resident of this area since 1996. I know this problem has been going on for a long time. Uh, I think it's time for all the parties to come together and work something out with public involvement and with a really good public outreach and education effort. Thank you. Well, I, I thank you. Um, and, uh, and this is, um, I think you're on the phone. So this is uh, Fire Chief Brian Helmick. And um, I think you you made some many valid points. So let me do the best I can to address your question. If I miss anything, please please follow back. Um, number one is there were previous attempts. Um, there were very very specific criticisms that came from the community that I got to observe as an employee, not the fire chief at the time, but also as a citizen of our jurisdiction through going to church and barbecues. I heard many of the criticisms why previous measures didn't fail or did fail. Um, it was, we were criticized of our business practices. We were criticized of transparency. We were criticized for lack of having a plan, not living within our means, utilizing scare tactics. The, those were the most critical things why we were told until you get those things in place and you come up with a sustainable solution that will fix the problems, you know, don't come back. Don't do another Band-Aid. Don't do things. And you know, also as a point of clarity, again, we are an independent special district with elected board of five. Uh, we are not part of Contra Costa County. We're not part of the city of Brentwood. We're not part of uh, Oakley or Brentwood. We're an independent special district, like a water district, a sewer district. We provide fire, rescue, and life-saving services to those jurisdictions. They are agency partners. We serve them. We work with each other, but we're completely independent of them. And so the two concepts that, that you're referencing to is a no-tax solution, which is a solution of which is taking existing revenue from elsewhere and transferring it to the fire department, which we have learned and heard that is a non-discussion starter voluntarily from local agencies. And the same thing as a state agency because the transfer is our problem. That's one side. And another side of what you're saying is creating a new revenue stream to increase right. add additional revenues into the fire district. So again, there's two, one side is problematic is transferring the problem. And another one is creating a new revenue stream. Tonight, you are part of an educational process because we have been challenged with 
historically, just as you stated, not having good reach and people not being aware of our governance, our challenges, our problems, and what we're going to do. Now, to be clear is that we have been challenged as a fire district with two previous initiatives with those historical problems that I believe over the last three years we have corrected. That's one. Number two is we are also being encouraged to not come out and make another ask until we explore all other alternatives and attempt to find as close as we can as a no tax solution to what we do. And the fire district and the fire district staff is doing our due diligence to try to find and identify all no new tax created by the fire district solutions to resolve our existing three station deficit. Those conversations sir, are happening as we speak. The fire board is also analyzing and monitoring that sales tax you referred to that will be voted on November to see if there's any positive impact on the fire district. We are also working with the other land use agencies, the city and the county to see if there's any opportunity for additional sustainable guaranteed revenue to come into the district. We're also looking at state initiatives, very specifically to ACA, what was previous ACA 11, now Proposition 19, that is supposed to go to help impact underfunded fire districts. The fire board is intentionally waiting to see how our feasibility from the items I just stated and including potential, is there, is there equities of consolidation, which are there's stale conversations in the past, we're seeing if they work now, what's happening at the state level, the local level, by the first week of November, the second week of November, all of those feasibility, all of the state initiatives, the dust is gonna to start to settle and the board is gonna to have to, with my support of providing them the feasibility studies, the findings from the state, the federal, the local level, the, the meetings we're having at the local level, trying to identify all other options or with other agencies, we got to place all of the results onto the table of the board saying we have a three station existing deficit. Maybe A, B and C eliminated a one station or two of the station deficits. And now we have an existing one station deficit. The question is, does the board want to present something in front of the community to address that existing deficit or not? Or maybe we can find a no tax solution in general, which is highly unlikely, but we are going to demonstrate doing what we can to erase that. The, the board is also directed me as the chief and my staff to come up with a one station, a two station, a three station, and since COVID hit in March, a three station tiered up plan to be able to bring in front of the people. So if we have a three station deficit, you don't ask for all three stations at once. You ask for one station every two year over a five year period. So you get one immediately, one two years later, and one year three. And we can use one time monies or grants to build the bridges to the sustainable revenue that comes in to increase service levels along the way so we can take care of it over a five year period. But the point I'm trying to make to you is the fire board has directed the staff to build those assessment methods and have them prepared for the board to analyze in November if needed. But I think that we all are desiring to try to come up or identify something creative along the way. Um, and we've been trying that diligently for three years. And so as we continue down those streams, sir, I think we're trying to educate and inform so nobody is surprised by where we've been, where we are, what our challenges are, and where we go as we make those decisions. And we really want people to believe in and understand what we have done as an agency, that we've done our due diligence, that we are running an organization business-wise, administratively, operationally, the best we can, and it's worth, if they have to, investing into, and they, they support the plan. And so, I don't know if that addresses your question, but the fire board's analyzing many things right now. Uh, we, we have discussed in public forum, they're gonna be reassessing all of our findings that we're actively pursuing between now and November. And they're gonna be making uh, the tough decisions uh, or decisions depending upon the findings between now and then, and that's, why it's so critically important you're here tonight. And I encourage you to stay engaged to see how this progresses. Okay, well, thank you. A lot of my questions. Um, but um, I, again, I think I've made the point and it's essential that the fire district work together 
with the cities and the unincorporated camping areas together to come up with a comprehensive solution to the problem. And um, again, the public outreach, I think there's room for improvement. For example, this flyer that I got in the mail about the town halls and the Facebook Live things, I got this in the mail the day after the Brentwood Town Hall. Um, and then the information on this did not make getting into this meeting tonight uh, easy. In fact, I couldn't get in on Zoom after six tries. I got locked out of Zoom, so I had to come in by phone. You really have to, um, you know, write these from a, a user-friendly perspective uh, for the public to make it easy for them to get into this stuff and feel like they're really involved. Um, so um, I like the idea that you're going to be you know, looking at these options and having some direction in November. Um, other funding sources should definitely be considered. Um, again, uh, I think I made the point that this Brentwood measure uh, to use, take funding from existing city sources is, is not realistic. Um, you need to come up with other funding sources um, and not take money away from existing services in cities um, that are already impacted by COVID. Um, and we only pay 10 bucks a year uh, for fire and life safety. That, that's incredible. Um, the public needs to know that because I think a lot of people, if they knew they're only paying 10 bucks a year, they'd say, heck, you know, it's, a, it's worth it to pay more than that. Um, so I hope that'll be a big part of the message too. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to highlight that, uh, message well received in regards to the, uh, the, what I'd say constructive criticism towards our outreach. Uh, we have made notes of those and, uh, we, we do strive to improve in all that we do. Um, and so uh, thank you for that feedback. Great. Thanks, Mitch. I'm glad you finally got on. Ho hopefully I helped you. Um, anyway, any more questions? Um, again, star nine to raise your hand on your phone. And if you are got your video on, just raise your hand. I am not seeing any questions. I don't have any questions in chat. So last chance, any more questions? We're at 8.59. Um, I am sending this back to Brian Oftedal to close us out. Nice. Thank you, Susanna. And thank you, everybody, for, for being here tonight. I know there were a lot of challenging conversations, and I know that uh, Chief Helmick and I are, are both uh, willing to have those conversations, further conversations. So please, uh, if we can, uh, reach out to us. Reach out to us via phone. I know uh, Chief Helmick and Fire Marshal Albert, both of their cell phone and email addresses were up there, and I'll uh, provide my cell phone and email address, and we're more than willing to sit down. As I said at the uh, start of this meeting that uh, you know, I've sat down with Mark out there a number of times on the island and Linda and other folks uh, numerous times. So I definitely don't mind coming out there and uh, having a meal or having a drink or whatever, a cup of coffee or, or what have you. I'd love to come out and sit down and, and answer all your questions and uh, get your feedback. That being said, uh, I did actually fail to mention uh, one of the elects on this call. I did see Bill Mayer from uh, Town of Discovery Bay. Thank you, Bill, for being here. Uh, we do have the Discovery Bay Town Hall coming up on the 24th, so I'm not quite sure who our representative is going to be, but maybe that could be you, Bill, uh, along with the, the town manager. Uh, that being said, the Town Hall is going to be on the 24th. Night, sweetie. And uh, Marsh Creek and Morgan Territory Town Hall will be on September 10th. And Byron Knightson Town Hall will be on September 14th. That is all on our website, eccfpd.org. We do also have those Facebook Live events, uh, August 18th, 25th, and September 14th, all at 6 p.m. Uh, my big ask is please stay informed, stay engaged, follow us on social media if you have that, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, 
uh, YouTube, Nextdoor. I know there's a number of other sites. Big one that I push uh, personally is PulsePoint. That's uh, the app that you can use that if you're wondering where the fire engines are going, you hear the sirens going, you can, if you've got that downloaded on your smartphone, you can look to see where the fire apparatus are heading. But more importantly, why I'm so uh, big on pulse point is the reason why it was put together. It's for cardiac arrest. And uh, something that I spoke about at the beginning that Mark Whitlock and I have put a lot of time and energy into is AEDs and uh, town safety, town preparedness. So it sounds like there was one of those AEDs that uh, maybe walked off that we need to look at getting another one out there somewhere on the island. Definitely will, more than willing to work with you on that, Mark. And uh, obviously when we wrap up COVID, you know, get out there and figure out how we can do some, some uh, CPR first aid training on the island. Uh, but that Pulse Point app does notify folks if you, if you enter in that you are trained in CPR, there's a little button that you can hit that uh, says that you're trained in CPR. If you're in the area of a cardiac arrest, once a 911 dispatch goes out, it will do a notification and it will allow community members to be part of the response. We definitely need, obviously with our response times where they're at, we definitely need the community's help. CPR, first aid, recognition, call a 911. Um, the only way we're, we're going to really save folks, and the only, being a paramedic, really the folks that we save is if they go into cardiac arrest in front of us or if somebody was doing bystander CPR. Anybody uh, that's gone down more than four to six minutes, the chances of resuscitation are, are horrible. So we do need the community's help. So please download Pulse Point. If you are trained in CPR, please hit that acknowledgement so we can add you as part of the solution. And uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's gonna be a hot weekend. Yeah, we are in fire season. Stay hydrated, try to stay indoors, protect yourself. Um, and uh, thank you again for being here. This is gonna really be a team effort, get, in, get into the next step. I know I don't want to uh, put the burden on the back of the constituents, on the back of the taxpayers. We are looking for all opportunities. I wanna make sure that the cities, the state, the county, wherever the grant funding, wherever we can go before we come back out. We, I think it's probably pretty clear that at some point we will have to go back out but I wanna make sure that we've hit every single point that we are able to before we go out and ask the taxpayers to take the hit. Cause I know that everybody is struggling right now and we are paying huge taxes. I think I'm gonna end it at that. It is uh, 9.05, uh, everybody spent quite a bit of time with us. Looking forward to having you join us at the Discovery Bay uh, Town Hall and Marsh Creek Town Hall. Please bring any outstanding questions to us there or email us. I did say that I'd provide my email address, which is boftedal at eccfpd. So I'll spell it out, b-o-f-t-e-d-a-l at eccfpd.org. And my cell phone number, 925-584-0592. I'm normally pretty quick with uh, responding to text messages and returning phone calls as long as I'm not on an emergency response myself. That being said, thank you again for joining us and uh, please share these Facebook Live and Town Hall sessions with friends and family, anybody that you know that lives in the district. Have a good night.